Hello everyone, this is just a short recap then of global systems and governance. To remind you, this is an A-level topic, so obviously if you're studying GCSE geography, there's absolutely no need to watch this video at all. So if we start right at the beginning of global systems and governance, I suppose the big things that you need to be aware of is this idea of dimensions of globalisation. So globalisation, in short, is just the process of countries becoming more connected. Okay, and that can be via any of these flows that you can see here on the left hand side. So that could be via flows of information. So think things like the internet and emails, flows of capital. So think a little bit about investment products. So think about labor costs, international trade services. So think like improvements in IT, for example, customer service, and then flows of labor. So this could be international migration, for example. So a mixture of these five things then are causing countries to become more connected and therefore support globalisation. So global systems are what we call interdependent, i.e. they rely on each other. So if we take these four categories we've broken them down into, for example, for economic, I might say, right, the trade of oil means that countries rely economically on each other. Socially, we've got greater connections between countries. Politically, well, we rely on countries to help solve issues. Think about the migrant crisis, for example, here. It illustrates that pretty well. And environmentally, so we're dependent on each other country to help us look after the environment. This links nicely on then to trading relationships. So I suppose there are three big groups you've got to know here. So you've got the global trade rules. So WTO creates rules about how countries can then trade. We have trading blocks. So these are like associations between different governments. And then changing trading relationships. So most trade takes place then between developed countries and therefore LICs are mainly trading with HICs or NEEs. This therefore means we have what we call differential access to markets. Okay. This top bullet point here I think is pretty important if you're going to recap that. So access to markets is how easy it is for countries to trade with each other. So normally this is determined by wealth or if you're a member of a trading block. Then you have your SDT agreements. So these allow least developed countries to bypass tariffs. So it promotes giving them access to markets. So you might argue these can be quite beneficial. However, there's a downside to this. So it does allow cheaper imports. And then you've got your economic and social consequences. So trade's obviously going to benefit the most developed countries looking at the information we've got here. However, higher levels of trade can help to improve quality of life. So it's almost like a balancing act about whether this is beneficial or whether this has got a lot of drawbacks. So if we think about the trends then that we've seen in global trade, this top bullet point is pretty important here. So the volume of trade has increased eight times between 1980 and 2008. We've also seen an increase in fair trade. Remember fair trade is the idea that the farmers and producers are getting equal price or fair price for their products. We've seen a lot of FDI, so foreign direct investment in another country to help generate profits. And again, we've got huge investment in emerging economies. It's e.g. it says China investing in Africa would be your best example there. So if we relate this then to an example, your first mini case study in global systems and governance is about bananas. Here it says them, we know bananas hopefully are grown in tropical regions, but the banana trade is dominated by two areas. Okay, So you've got your dollar producers that are controlled by large TNCs. You've also got your ACP group. Okay, so that's Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific. The largest importers then are the US and the EU. So in the UK, we're part of that. Which leads us on then to this idea of banana wars. So this is the longest trade war in history lasting over 20 years. It started when the EU gave special and differential treatment to previous colonies. And now there's this big push on fair trade. So it's been a steady growth in the sale of sustainable bananas which includes this idea of fair trade and organic. So these are aimed at helping small-scale producers as part of that ACP group. So if we go back to the start, we talked a lot about interdependence, this idea that groups or countries are reliable for each other. 
well, the issues we've had now then are that we've got unequal flows of people, which creates benefits, but also brings about inequalities. So we've got people migrating for jobs, but remittances and the brain drain impact the host country. We've got unequal flows of money causing inequalities. Again, foreign aid, foreign direct investment there, all having an impact. Ideas about how the world works are dominated by developed countries. We said as part of trade, well, our LICs are hugely influential in that, but yet it's still dominated by the developed world. Globalisation makes some countries more powerful than others. It's linked quite back, doesn't it, to that issue we were just talking about here. And global institutions can reinforce unequal powers. So the IMF, the International Monetary Fund and World Bank govern financial institutions. So you might argue they do reinforce this unequal power relation. So factors of globalisation. Again, I hope most of you know these, but let's just recap them. So you've got systems and technology and relationships, financial systems, trade agreements, transport communication, security and management information systems. Again, if you need to pause this here, please do. But in short, for each one of these, you need to know a bit about what they do and hopefully you're able to evaluate whether they're actually beneficial or whether they bring any limitations. So this leads us nicely on then to thinking about TNCs and the role that TNCs play. Your case study here is Apple. Okay, make sure you know this is an example, please. So with TNCs, then we're thinking about com companies that operate in two or more countries. They account for about 80% of global trade. So if we think about this then and how we can apply this to Apple, Apple's the third largest manufacturer of mobile phones, the second largest IT company. It's got headquarters then in more than one country. So therefore this constitutes it being part of a TNC. Think about how this may well impact on other countries. The nice little bit of information here in particular about the impact it has on HICs and NEEs. Again, just check you can apply this information in the exam if you needed to. And then last but not least, your final case study is thinking about Antarctica as a global common. So Antarctica covers an area about 14 million kilometres squared and it's got 70% of the world's ice and 70% of the fresh water. So really it's a huge natural resource that we've all got equal investment in. So there are four main threats to Antarctica. We've got climate change, fishing and whaling, search for minerals, and tourism and research. So if we go back to the first one, climate change, well, the west coast of Antarctica has risen by three degrees Celsius. Our ice shelves are melting, fishing and whaling. We've got huge threats then from overfishing. Again, this impacts on other species, so threatens biodiversity. We've got the search for minerals. So large deposits of coal, oil, and iron are buried underneath Antarctica. And then tourism. So it can lead to air pollution, increased risk perhaps as well of fuel spills. So again, for each one of these, I suppose you need to know what are the threats and why is it a threat? If we then think about NGOs, so non-governmental organisations within Antarctica, again, these are really important for monitoring the threats. So they don't act on behalf of the country because they're positioned to observe whether countries are following the law. If we relate that then to international law, You've got the Antarctic Treaty, well worth remembering this one. So this was 1959. So that's the agreement that countries have signed up to to sustainably manage Antarctica's ecosystem. You've got the IWC, so the International Whaling Commission. Again, they're responsible for regulating whaling and making sure the population's at a sustainable level. You've got the United Nations Environment Programme. And you've also got the Whaling Moratorium. Okay, so banning commercial whaling in 1982. So because we've got all of that governance, and this bit up here, if you're unsure, that's what we mean by global governance, this does bring with it some consequences. So the melting ice in Antarctica has formed efforts to combat climate change, can be positive, limits resources and therefore slows down economic growth. I'd argue that's negative. Scientific research allows collaboration of scientists from all over the world who can pool their resources, huge positive, and allows tourists to visit safely. I'd also argue that's a positive. 
So I suppose if I was being asked to weigh out global governance for a case study or a cold environment, I'd be thinking here, actually, I think this is pretty positive for Antarctica based on the balance of probabilities, looking at these four points I've got here. Of course, you can disagree with me, but that's where your AO2 mark is going to come from in your 20 markers. So if we link this finally then back to global governance, well, I can branch this again in three categories. So I know the first thing as part of global governance is that the world is governed by norms, laws and institutions. It's aiming to promote growth and stability. However, it does create inequalities and injustices as we've looked at. So for each one of these now, just check you can go back and you can link it to some of these bullet points I've put below. I suppose you would need to know why this is an issue and again, make sure that you could evaluate it, therefore score some AO2 marks. So these points that I've put in here, these would help with that AO2, that evaluation that we talk about. Finally then, the global commons, I suppose, is the last key thing we need to talk through. So the global commons do not belong to one country and they're governed by different pieces of international law, i.e. Antarctica. Again, think about the tragedy of the commons. So industrialisation and development meant the global commons are at risk. Technologies made it easier to access global commons. They're under pressure from overfishing, pollution, climate change, acidification. So we do have a need to protect these commons. Institutions are acknowledging the right of countries to develop. Think about your big NGOs, so WWF, Greenpeace. They've called for these commons to be protected. So sustainable development does require cooperation. So again, finally then, to sort of sum up, if we're going to critique this, benefits would include integration, development, economic growth, stability. However, that does come at huge cost. So inequalities, be that with people, money, finance, conflict, injustice, but also it does come at a risk and a consequence to the environment too. Again, just check, I know we keep saying it, but have you got that O2? Are you able to evaluate this here? Okay, hope this has been really helpful. And as ever, if you've got any questions, please ask.